from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, a Bloomberg scoop. Robinhood is planning to add new features to let users get their paychecks two days early, stepping up competition with traditional banks and even PayPal. We'll tell you more about the trading app's plans. Plus, Apple mandates all U.S. employees report their vaccination status, whether they're working in the office or not. It's one step short of requiring vaccines, but one step closer to an aggressive campaign by corporations to help stop the spread of COVID. And the pandemic has sparked a worldwide mental health crisis. From children to grown-ups to seniors, two wellness companies, Headspace and Ginger, are now joining forces to combat a different kind of pandemic on the home front. But we begin with headlines breaking just in the last few minutes. The U.S. Department of Justice preparing a second Monopoly lawsuit against Google over the company's digital ad business, according to Bloomberg sources. This in addition to the antitrust case looking into Google's web search business. For more, I'm joined now by Mark Bergen, who, of course, covers Google and Alphabet for us. So, Mark, what do we know about this pending case and how does it differ from the first? So the, the main difference from the first, so with our, to answer your first question, what we know is that uh, our reporting says that the DOJ is, uh, we know that they've been looking into this, it seems like they're preparing a case potentially by the end of this year. Uh, and the core difference is the first case looked at Google search and specifically at its deal with Apple to put Google as a default search engine. This is primarily, primarily focused on Google's ad tech. And so it's, it's big machinery, it's like all the behind the scenes work, um, it's network business that sells you know, to, to every single display ad, a lot of display ads you see on the web, as well as mobile. And then they also own and operate a lot of the exchanges along, along the way, uh, which is something that the Texas uh, Attorney General's case has been focused on. Uh, talking about what Alphabet has said so far, uh, came out with a statement, our advertising technologies help websites and apps fund their content, enable small businesses to grow and protect users from exploitative privacy uh, practices and bad ad experiences. There's enormous competition in ad tools, which has made online ads more relevant, reduced fees and expanded options for publishers and advertisers. Talk to us about how Google uh, is likely to approach this particular suit and has been uh, approaching this antitrust scrutiny in general. Yeah, I mean, their, their approach to the – this is similar to their, their response to the Texas lawsuit. And the Texas lawsuit involves sort of uh, what the attorney general accused Google and Facebook of, uh, who are the sort of two dominant players in this market, of doing this ad, uh, this sort of deal, uh, behind-the-scenes deal, kind of cloak and dagger to benefit each other. Uh, the companies have both said that this is sort of par for the course and how the ad tech world operates. I think that'll be – Google's case, it'll also depend on a lot of this argument that they give back a lot of the money to publishers, something they, and they sort of sustain this um, news publisher and web publisher economy. Uh, you know, Google's also going to probably point to there's been a fair amount of growth in independent ad tech companies, uh, some of public that have gone very well. You know, uh, on the other, other hand, AT&T and Verizon were two players that both got into this in the past few years and then quickly retreated. Uh, and most likely, you know, AT&T is certainly involved in the, in the Texas case and arguing that, that one of the reasons that they retreated is because of Google's dominance. All right. So Google potentially facing yet another antitrust suit from the Department of Justice, uh, in addition to another one uh, filed earlier this year. Bloomberg's Mark Bergen, thanks so much for that update. We'll continue to follow how that plays out. I want to take a look now at the markets and kick it off with our own Kriti Gupta. Kriti, some questions about whether tech's going to continue to go up. Are we seeing the tech rally start to falter? Absolutely. Well, green on the screen. And today, not really, actually. Big tech leading those gains. The S&P 500 notching yet another record. That is 54 year-to-date by Emily by only two points. So really crucial here that new, the New York Bank Index was really the one that's higher. I want to show you a terminal chart here of just how much momentum is coming back into the market. The New York Bank Index relative to the S&P 500 equal weight. And you can see this little lift right here really showing you that that defensive trade is back in vogue. Let's take a look at what the other tech subsectors are doing, though, because not all tech tech was on board semiconductors which usually outperform with big tech lagging today so something to watch as we start to see this tech bundle trade potentially continue to grow in the next coming months that's the macro emily let's get to the micro with ed ludlow yeah i want to get straight to earnings and after hours move as okta 
the web app developer down 1.6% in after hours, have been down more significantly. Earnings in line, decent forecast, but the market not liking something. Really, the story in earnings today, charge point, up around 10%. After hours, 65% top line growth, 185,000 charge points installed. And speaking of EVs, I've been taking a look at Lucid today. Really steep drop. We saw a lockup on pipe shares expire. We knew this was coming. These are the investors that bought in, the institutional investors in that original SPAC deal. So really interesting tech moves on the day as well. Emily? Seinfeld is coming October the 1st. Netflix up two and a quarter percent on Wednesday. This was a deal announced back in 2019. We've been wondering when it's going to hit the platform. And finally, you heard Critty talk about the strength of the Fang Index. Interesting then to see Chinese ADRs doing so well on Wednesday. Baidu, JD.com doing well. One big points decliner, CrowdStrike down almost 4% on Wednesday. Some concerns about the cybersecurity space and the strength for investors in that sector. Emily. All right, Ed, thanks so much. As Ed just mentioned there, talking about cybersecurity, the company CrowdStrike out with quarterly results and analysts suggesting the results didn't meet the most bullish of expectations. Uh, this does uh, remain a top pick, though, across the cybersecurity sector. Joining us for an exclusive interview, CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz. So, George, shares ending the day down uh, almost 4% today. What's your message to investors this afternoon? Well, my message is we had a fantastic quarter at 70% ARR growth at scale. I think it's truly remarkable. We saw uh, an acceleration in customer ads, 1,660 customers. And at the end of the day, um, you know, we're winning some really big deals and uh, creating a lot of shareholder value. So you're going to see a little noise, uh, maybe short term. And, um, you know, we don't get distracted by that as a management team. And we continue to focus on delivering value for our customers and stopping breaches. Now, uh, President Biden has been increasingly focused on what's happening in cyberspace on the back of some really high-profile hacks that you and I have talked about over the last year. He just had big tech CEOs from you know, Apple, Amazon, Alphabet, um, all at the White House talking about uh, how the public and private sectors can cooperate more to, to combat some of these threats. What was your main takeaway from that meeting? Do you think much will, will come out of it, and will the private sector indeed step up? Well, I hope so. And I think it does uh, take a partnership, private uh, sector and public sector to come together to face these uh, challenging uh, adversaries. And, you know, when you look at some of the executive orders that have come down, I think um, it matches up quite nicely with what CrowdStrike actually can deliver, advanced uh, breach protection and a lot of um, the technology that we have leveraging AI uh, to uncover these advanced adversaries. So we're hopeful with the new administration. Obviously, it takes time in the government, um, but we're also working with them uh, extensively, and we want to be part of the solution. Uh, the president put the burden squarely on private companies for not doing enough to train workers to fill the jobs that are needed across the cyber sector. What did you make of that? Well, I, I talked about in my earnings call, in the, in the cyberspace uh, sector, there's uh, 3 million open jobs, and it, there's such a, a shortage in critical skills. Um, and you know, one of the things that I mentioned in our earnings call was Falcon Complete, which is really a force multiplier for companies that allows companies to leverage our Falcon platform, but also allows us to manage the entire life cycle of that, including any remediation action. So that's been a real shining star for us. And I think the skills shortage really highlights the needs for technologies like Falcon Complete. Now, a lot of the talk, of course, uh, over the last couple of weeks, Afghanistan has dominated the headlines. I just read a, a headline in the, in the Washington Post, though, that said an undeclared war is breaking out in cyberspace. What do you make of that characterization. Obviously, we've seen heightened threats in cyberspace um, over the last 12 months. It's it's perhaps only going to get more extreme. But would you use that terminology? Well, undeclared, uh, you know, breaking out means that it's just starting. Uh, I've been at this for a long time, and <laughs> it started a long time ago. When you look at the capabilities of some of these nation-state adversaries, what they've been able to do, and uh, how it's even trickled down to some of the e-crime groups. Uh, this has been happening for a long time, even if you go back to 2010 and some of the high-profile breaches. Um, this is an ongoing effort by these governments uh, and corporate espionage, and it's not going to stop. And it's a very effective way to gain information. It's a very effective way to potentially damage and knock out infrastructure uh, of other countries. So we need to be on our A-game and um, you know, th there's a reason why we're, we're out helping big customers because it's not just governments, but it's also customers that 
are uh, targets of these nation state actors. Does the balance of power changing in the Middle East uh, impact what, what's happening in, in cyberspace at all? Uh, you know, are you potentially on alert for new or evolving threats as a result of that? Well, certainly when you look at the adversaries, we break them down into nation state -y crime hacktivism. You know, you might see an uptick in hacktivism. Uh, we've seen a lot of activity out of Iran in the past uh, from a Middle, Middle East perspective. And, um, you know, part of the challenge is, uh, you know, everything is digital right now. And a lot of the communications by these terrorists are done in encrypted channels. And, you know, what does that mean uh, in, in terms of, um, you know, being able to identify uh, sort of vulnerabilities and in, in infrastructures uh, that are out there? I mean, these are all relevant questions, but at the end of the day, um, you know, I think the environment continues to, to worsen from a threat landscape perspective. And it's one of the reasons why customers need to protect themselves. All right. CrowdStrike CEO George Kurtz, always good to have you with us. Thanks so much for joining us for an exclusive so interview today. We're going to have much more on Tech Results Thursday, Broadcom and DocuSign out after the ballot. You can catch all those details right here on Bloomberg Technology. But coming up, Robinhood set to rival PayPal and traditional banks with a new feature that allow users to get their paychecks up to two days early. More details on this market moving story next. This is Bloomberg. Apple is asking all of its U.S. employees to report their vaccination status, regardless of whether they're working remotely or at the office. This is an escalation from the company's previous policy, which asked employees in California Washington and New Jersey for this information in accordance with local regulations. For more, we're joined by our Bloomberg News reporter, Mark Gurman, who, of course, covers Apple for us. Mark, tell us about this escalation in policy and why Apple is doing this. So Apple sent a memo last night to all U.S. employees, both corporate and retail, asking them to fill out a form on their internal HR site to indicate whether or not they are vaccinated. Apple is still not mandating vaccines, but of course asking employees if they're vaccinated or not is a, another slight nudge to get vaccinated. Of course, Apple wants all staffers back in the office in a safe manner. And according to you know, local guidelines, the FDA and the CDC, the safest way to do that is to make sure that as many folks as possible are vaccinated. So that of course is what Apple is campaigning for internally. Increasingly, Mark, we're seeing companies take matters into their own hands to push vaccinations. You know, Delta charging its employees $200 a month every month that goes by that they're not vaccinated. Do you think we're going to see more moves like this from other big tech companies? Well, I can tell you Apple is not doing that. They are not mandating vaccines and they are very likely not going to start paying employees to get vaccinated or firing employees who refuse to get vaccinated. So this is basically, at least at this point, they're leaving it up uh, to the employees. Obviously, Apple is a little bit more in a complex situation than Facebook and some of the other companies. Apple, of course, has offices in nearly every state, if not retail stores, and as well as several other countries. And making a company-wide uh, mandate is not so easy, given the political climate, red states versus blue states, religious preferences of some employees. So it's a bit of a more complex situation because of the way Apple is structured on a global scale. Uh, so at this point, I don't see them mandating it. But of course, that could change depending on the numbers that they see come in later this month from the employee survey. All right. Uh, hang on, Mark, because you had another big scoop out today. Uh, you've been following Robinhood and reporting that the company is working on a new feature that lets users receive their paycheck up to two days early. This steps up its competition with PayPal, I also want to bring in Bloomberg's Shanali Basik, who covers Robinhood for us. Uh, Shanali, what do you make of these uh, new developments that Mark has reported? How significant is it, given that Robinhood is trying to expand its services and finding itself in more competition with uh, companies like PayPal and traditional banks as well? Yeah, I'm here to confirm for you that Mark's scoop is putting Wall Street on notice, as well as more of the fintech industry. Robinhood has said that its ambition is to be much more than a trading platform right but what we didn't know was how fast that would come to fruition direct deposits makes it much closer to becoming more like a banking institution at a time where customers are very concerned about banks the fees they charge and how
how fast they get their money. So Robinhood's product is offering speed and transparency, presumably, uh, and we know that many others are on the heels of this as well. So, Mark, tell us a little bit more about what you found, because often you discover these developments buried in code uh, somewhere uh, that nobody else uh, would be able to find. What exactly did you discover? Yes, yeah, so early pay, we discovered the code inside a beta version of their upcoming update to their iPhone app, and it pretty transparently lines out that this is functionality they're working on, this is functionality they're planning to add. And like you said, this lets you get your paycheck depending on your employer, depending on the payroll system they use two days early. And it's basically a loan uh, that lasts for two days. You know, for some people or probably everyone, having the money a couple days in advance could be very helpful to have that in your account. And PayPal offers a similar feature, Wealthfront Chime. So this is Robinhood saying, hey, we're here too with more of these traditional uh, banking features. Now, Shanali, what do you make of this given the controversy surrounding Robinhood in general? The remarks from Gary Gensler earlier this week, that payment for order flow, um, you know, potentially banning that is, is on the table, something that the SEC is considering. I mean, clearly Robinhood has to look uh, at expanding its, its revenue streams, right, if it's going to survive some of these regulatory issues? They have to look beyond the revenue stream, even if they didn't face the regulatory issues. This is a business that customers will trust you and use you more the more products that they are able to uh, access with you, right? You see that kind of similar push when it comes to SoFi, which is trying to become a full-scale bank on top of trading and on top of credit services. But listen, when it comes to payment for order flow, I'm glad you asked the question because if they, they've said that they will try to internalize the order flow if the SEC were to ban payment for order flow. So even if they try to ban payment for order flow, you have a very complicated new method that the SEC also isn't sure that they're comfortable with Robinhood or others uh, doing at such a scale as well. So it's a tough balance. It'll take a long time to work out. But this diversification of the business, it's uh, as much as it's coming fast, payment for order flow, uh, the transaction-based services are still about 80% of the business. So as far as revenue diversification, it's not happening as fast as these announcements are coming out. Right. Okay. Well, we'll continue to watch how Robinhood's business model evolves. Mark Gurman, great scoop from you. Shanali, thanks so much for the additional context there. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the desperate measures being taken in North Ca Northern California as flames continue to burn close to resort towns near Lake Tahoe. All the details next. This is Bloomberg. I want to bring you the latest now on the wildfires burning across large swaths of Northern California. One of the biggest happening right now Near Lake Tahoe, this is an area well known for skiing through the winter months, but those ski resorts are now turning their snowmaking equipment into firefighting tools to protect their buildings. For more, we're joined by Mark Chediak, who's been covering the fires for Bloomberg News. And Mark, the fire is getting increasingly closer to ski resorts like Heavenly, like Kirkwood, names that anyone who has skied in, in Tahoe probably knows. What is the latest? Yeah, hi. Thanks for having me on again. So uh, the Calder fire is uh, is threatening, like you said, those two ski resorts, and they have resorted to using uh, their snowmaking equipment, these snow cannons, to spray uh, water on their slopes um, and on their buildings and other, uh, other critical infrastructure there to uh, prevent the fire from uh, burning on their properties. Now, the blaze uh, is very close to Kirkwood. In fact, uh, the owner of the property told us today that they were seeing spot fires there, and but they were able to put those out. Um, the edge of the blaze, which is uh, unfortunately has not burned into South Lake Tahoe, they've been able to keep the fire out of the city and the outskirts of the city, uh, and they're trying to get that fire to skirt around. But um, unfortunately, Heavenly is right in the path of, of where the fire is headed. So they, too, are using their uh, snowmaking equipment to uh, douse, uh, douse their slopes. Now, I know one of the biggest concerns is those embers that can fly in any direction, you know, up to a mile away 
from the heart of the fire itself. So uh, if the blaze is two miles from Heavenly, for example, isn't that pretty close? Yeah, that's very close. And that's why they're uh, really worried about this. They, you know, Heavenly has been evacuated. Um, and what, it, what happens is that today they're seeing gusty winds up to 30, 35 miles per hour. And those winds can pick up these embers and, and, and basically toss them up to a mile away. And these embers can fall and start these what they call spot fires. And if they don't get to these spot fires, they can develop into their own sort of fire and uh, create its own sort of problem. This is what they're worried about also with the, uh, with the community of South Lake Tahoe, that, the, that these embers could blow in, into, uh, into neighborhoods and start fires there, and then you have an urban, uh, an urban wildland fire. So what are firefighters telling you at this point about how much the fire is contained and how likely it is they'll be able to stop it before it gets to the town, before it gets to these resorts? Uh, that's a great question. So the fire is about 20% contained, although it's mostly contained on its western edge where it started uh, in the hills uh, east of Sacramento. Uh, but it's been very active in and around South Lake Tahoe. However, fire up. Uh, Fire officials sounded pretty confident today and hopeful that they were going to be able to keep it away from South Lake Tahoe and kind of steer it, like I said, northeast. Um, they were actually trying to move the fire uh, into um, into the fire scar of another fire that burned uh, recently there called the Tamarack Fire. And they're hoping by doing that, uh, that'll slow down the momentum of the fire because it would it move it into a, a place that's already burned. Uh, the other thing that they are talking about is the fire it probably will cross the California state line into Nevada, uh, into into some pretty rugged terrain. But but uh, crews are stationed now on the Nevada side of the border, building these uh, what they call these like containment lines to, to essentially what they described as build this giant catcher mat to to stop the fire there. Okay, uh, Mark, thank you so much for bringing us your reporting on this. Uh, well, we'll continue to stay posted. Uh, uh, as that story evolves. Mark Chediak, thank you. Coming up, a mental health merger of sorts. We speak to the CEOs of Headspace and the mental health platform Ginger about their new collaborative platform to make support accessible to everyone in these very uncertain pandemic times. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. As the pandemic rages on and takes its toll on our collective mental health, two major wellness leaders, Headspace and Ginger, are joining forces to meet the challenge. They've recently announced their intent to merge and create Headspace Health, which will offer mindfulness and meditation support, behavioral health coaching, therapy, and so much more. Joining us now, Headspace Health and Ginger CEO Russell Glass and Headspace Health President and Headspace CEO, CC Morgan, uh, Russell and CC, thank you so much for joining us. CC, I'll start with you. Um, why this decision to merge and why now? Yeah, if you think about it, all of us have mental health. It's just a matter of where we are in the continuum. Are we dealing with mental health prevention and promotion? Are we dealing with something that needs to be managed, a more serious condition? Or are we dealing with uh, something that needs to be curated? And we move back and forth on this continuum through our lives. What we found in working with our members and our partners was people were really enjoying what they experienced with Headspace, but sometimes they had a condition where they needed to talk to someone, they needed a coach or a therapist, and we were being pulled in that direction. When you put together Ginger and Headspace, we solved this full continuum, and that way we can be with people, whatever it is they need. And Ginger Russell offers that text-based behavioral health coaching, video-based therapy. Talk to us about what the two platforms offer and how they complement each other, really, to make a merger make sense. You know, this, this crisis existed pre-pandemic. Uh, you know, World Health Organization estimates there's a billion people that have a mental health need, and then the pandemic just accelerated that. It's, it's a perfect storm of mental health need. 
And we are providing, as you said, this end-to-end -end ability to deliver care, real-time access to coaching, therapy, psychiatry, but recognize that if we're gonna solve this supply-demand imbalance, this the situation where far more people need care than can get access, we have to start upstream. We have to get people thinking about building routines for resilience and really taking care of the, their mental health before it gets acute. And when you bring these two platforms together, Headspace has this be beloved brand and experience. Millions of people use it every day to, to help them with their mental health needs, to build routines that last a lifetime. And for those who have more need, Ginger can deliver additional care. That combination is, we believe, going to democratize mental health around the world. Technology and telehealth really have offered so many uh, new opportunities to combat mental health issues because often you need that help, uh, you know, in a moment. It's, it's urgent. Uh, you can't wait to, to see your therapist, for example. Um, Cece, talk to us about some of the mental health trends you've been seeing in the pandemic. I know, you know, uh, this isn't just limited to, uh, to, to, to workers. You have children facing mental health issues because they haven't been able to go to school. I mean, it, you know, you really are, are seeing mental health issues across the gamut. You know, um, it, you're exactly right. In fact, uh, Russ just gave the figure of a billion people. And if you look at the statistics from the CDC, 50% of us will have a diagnosable mental health condition in our lifetime. 75% of that will go untreated. And when that happens, it leads to more chronic conditions or even physical conditions. The stress and the pressure of the past year, partially with the pandemic, partially with social injustice, working remotely, all of those things added additional stress and anxiety. One of the areas that we've seen the most push for mental health and mental wellness has been in the employer segment. So previously, leaders would talk about physical health and physical wellness, but very rarely did they openly talk about mental health. And this year, most CEOs are talking about pledging and making mental health and wellness a priority. And you know, if I think about anything that's good that's come out of the last 18 months, it's that this is now a topic and the stigma is beginning to come down. We have a long way to go, but the stigma is beginning to come down and employers are making this a priority and offering solutions in the workplace. Russell, how would you like to see companies step up more in terms of, you know, offering this as a benefit, recognizing it as a problem? To CeCe's point, I think it's starting to happen. I think this has gone from an HR problem to a boardroom problem. Boards are looking at this, executive teams are looking at this as a business continuity issue that can't be ignored any longer. And uh, I think right now is the time for companies to invest in solutions that help employees first realize that it, it doesn't need to be stigmatized, that, that everybody has mental health, that really thinking about and, and uh, managing your own mental health needs, burnout needs, et cetera, is not only uh, important, but the company encourages it. We, we want employees doing that to make sure that you're there and at your best throughout your career. And then providing solutions that recognize people can be anywhere on that spectrum from, from you know just mild anxiety, mild stress, day-to-day -day living, to serious mental illness that can use support for uh, people to, to feel healthier and more productive. CC, this is now a global platform. What kinds of trends are you seeing globally? Do you see any difference between countries and what users need? We don't see as much difference between what users need globally. We do see a difference in the stigma globally. And so different, different countries, different cultures are more open to talking about it. But again, across the boat or across the board, all boats have risen. Um, we do see therapy and coaching being adopted at different rates in different countries. We are starting to see meditation and mindfulness being utilized across the board. And in fact, even with Headspace, you know, about half of our members, excuse me, are outside of the U.S. And we expect to see that trend continue. Russell, as you mentioned, uh, the pandemic, uh, the mental health crisis existed long before the pandemic, but the pandemic has certainly exacerbated some of the stresses and, and anxieties um, we feel on a daily basis and introduced new ones. Do you have any concern that this, the impacts of this particular 
period of time will last many years beyond the pandemic itself? I, I do. You know, I, I wish this was a light switch that we could just turn off. I think that the, the, some of the reasons for, you know, the pandemic accelerating this already big need gets to things like uncertainty and disruption and uh, health, not knowing if you're going to catch this thing or not. And those things aren't going away anytime soon. And, and so as we move forward, I think the recognition as business leaders, as society, is just that we have to think about mental health just as a part of overall health and that managing mental health, making people understand the benefits and opportunities there are to support everybody's mental health, critically important. One other note I'd make is that business leaders are in a, a position today to really, to really help people, to, to ask and, and mean, how are you doing? Because it's hard for people to say, I need help. It's not natural, but the more that we can destigmatize that, the more that we can be asking, how are you doing? No, really, how are you doing? And, and uh, getting them to the help they need, the better you know, all of our employees are going to be and society is going to be. CC, there seems to be a clear call to action, especially with what Russell just said, to companies, to leaders here. What about for individuals uh, who... You know, the thought of getting help or asking for help just seems like too big, you know, a mountain to climb. You know, how do you make it and how does your platform make it easier and more digestible, um, you know, to just seek help in, in nuggets, if you will? You know, there's a couple of things that happen here. One of them is to talk about mental health outside of the platform. So you may be aware that we've launched several Netflix series. And the purpose of those Netflix series is actually just to start talking about mental health and wellness and to make it okay for people in primetime viewing to watch these things. We've also done things, uh, shows on Sesame Street. And Sesame Street is designed to teach very young children that it's okay to think about, to have emotions, um, but to get in control of those emotions and that there's exercises that you can do to be in control of those emotions, of those emotions. When you look within our app, we have uh, about 5,000 different pieces of content. And because our goal is to build healthy routines that last a lifetime, the content varies throughout your day. So we have content for when you wake up, how you eat, how you meditate, how you work, how you deal with your kids at school, how you sleep, um, how you exercise, how you deal with financial stress, divorce, uh, any kind of emotional stress is in there. And the programs are broken into bite-sized chunks, to use your words, um, that enable you to do things for as little as three minutes at a time, but at least to get you to be present and aware of what you're feeling and give you some, some tactics on how to deal with it. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much for bringing this story to us. Uh, Headspace CEO, CC Morgan, Ginger CEO, Russell Glass will be following um, your new uh, combination of companies as this plays out. Meantime, the maker of TurboTax and QuickBooks is looking to buy email marketing firm MailChimp. Bloomberg has learned that Intuit is in talks to acquire MailChimp for more than $10 billion. If the deal goes through, it would be Intuit's biggest acquisition ever. The company is looking to build on its small business customer base, many of whom are recovering from COVID-19 disruptions. Coming up, Checker raises $250 million in a funding round that more than doubles its valuation. I'll speak with the CEO about his focus on digital hiring as more companies adopt flexible work schedules next. This is Bloomberg. the technology platform that uses artificial intelligence to power and improve the background check process just raised $250 million in a new funding round. It values the company at $4.6 billion, more than doubling the valuation from a year earlier. Checker performs 30 million background checks a year for companies like Uber, Lyft, Instacart, and more. Joining us now for a look at digital hiring and the future of the gig economy is Checker CEO Daniel Yanis, our guest in this week's City Lab series. Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. Introduce us to Checker and how you are using artificial intelligence and technology to do background checks differently. 
Yes, um, so Checker is a leading HR tech software company. Uh, we are known for having launched the first API for background checks. So really building the software infrastructure for hiring uh, in the future of work. Um, so we're known for our API for background checks, but now we've scaled the business um, to, to an impressive tens of thousands of customers. Uh, we have multiple API products and we're excited uh, about this new fundraise um, in order to build more products and more infrastructure for the future of work. What do you see as the benefits for employees, for gig economy workers, especially as the workforce moves to hybrid mode and is offering more flexibility to workers in general? Yes, so all of the work is moving more uh, remotely and digital and online. So software is really the solution. Um, HR and people software is going to have to really change to adapt to this trend. And um, I think what's really important for the candidates, for the workers, is to have a great user experience, to have more fairness, um, less bias in the different types of uh, HR software they're using. And one solution to that is to build APIs. APIs allow for uh, great software and great user experiences to be built. And at Checker, we're very focused on fairness, removing bias. Um, we're known for fair chance hiring and helping giving second chances to people with, uh, with criminal records, for example. AI, of course, isn't perfect, especially because it relies often on algorithms that are designed and developed by humans. Uh, there have been lawsuits to this effect claiming that some of Checker's background processes are discriminatory, particularly with respect to Uber. What's your response to that and to this idea in general that technology isn't the end-all, be-all? Yeah, so, you know, AI is not a, a solution to everything. Um, Background checks are not a silver bullet, so you know it is a, a hard problem to solve. Um, at Checker, we care a lot about the accuracy, about helping the workers, and at this point, we've been able to really disrupt our industry to bring 10 times more accuracy thanks to software. Um, software and technology in general is able to make less errors than humans, um, but of course, humans are biased and AI can be biased as well. So we are um, leveraging you know, the best technology possible in order to improve accuracy, to help workers get opportunities and, um, and avoid any errors that could impact the consumers or the workers. $250 million to put to work, $4.6 billion valuation. How do you plan to spend that money and any plans to go public? Yeah, so we're really excited about that uh, new fundraise. Uh, we're a high growth uh, software company. We're profitable as well. So we'll use this round to continue to build uh, great innovation and products in order to delight our tens of thousands of customers. Um, we don't have uh, IPO plans at this point in time. Uh, we're excited to, to just continue to, to grow and, uh, and delight our customers and create more opportunities and fair chances for, for workers. All right, we'll keep watching. Checker CEO Daniel Yanis, thank you so much for joining us. Well, Elon Musk's boring company is close to a deal to build a tunnel in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. The project would transport Tesla riding passengers about two and a half miles from downtown to the beach. A deadline for other companies to submit proposals for the tunnel passed last Monday. The Spanish EV charging company Wallbox Chargers just announced it'll build a U.S. factory in Arlington, Texas. The company focuses on chargers that you install in your home. If there's excess power in the car's battery, you can use it to feed power back into the grid. In June, Wallbox agreed to go public via SPAC in a deal valuing the company at $1.5 billion. Now it's going to invest $44 million in Texas to help grow deliveries in North America. Enrique Asuncion, CEO of Wallbox Chargers, spoke with R. Ed Ludlow. Energy is an important industry in, in Texas. There's a culture of innovation, the academics. We have the skilled workers. And, you know, we are having an amazing growth uh, all around the U.S. Co uh, continent. And it's an ideal location for logistics. Hey, Emric, what I want to know is what was the offer on the table from the city of Arlington, the state of Texas? What kind of subsidies hmm. did you get and tax breaks? So what we have seen, it's a very agile uh, support from the city. You know, we are going super fast and we are now selling our home products uh, in, in the U.S. But for the, at the beginning and second half of next year, we will be selling our bidirectional charger and our fast charger. So we needed a factory uh, fast to start the production at the second half of next year. So what we've seen, you know, a lot of support. We're still finishing the last uh, parts of the agreement, but, you know, 
uh, support on the on on tax breaks and and subsidies in general. So this is a pretty crowded market, right? There are all kinds of charging companies in the US, in Europe. But Alex is absolutely right. You guys are kind of more focused on the residential at-home chargers. My question is, how do you sell these things? Do you partner with the car makers themselves that are working on EVs, try and get partnerships so that when I buy an EV, I get one of your chargers included? Do you guys spend heavily on marketing? How do people actually get to know about Warbox and choose your technology? Yeah, so... We sell through all channels. You know, of course, partnerships are critical for us. We partner with some of the most important car manufacturers in the world and utility companies. This is almost half of our sales, but we also have our direct sales through Amazon.com, through our website, or even through installers and distributors all over the world. So we also do partnerships. For example, we recently announced a partnership with a company called SunPower. It's a leading mm -hmm. installer of solar installations in the US. And, you know, we are offering all the installations that use solar uh, the possibility to charge the car only with solar power. We have the right technology to charge with solar, which is the cheapest energy you can get, and also to use your car as a battery for the home, you know? So when you charge with the energy from your solar panels to your car, and then at night you power your home with your car, thanks to our chargers. The CEO of Wallbox there with our own Ed Ludlow. All right, coming up, getting paid in advance. It's not just Robin Hood getting into the game. After the break, we're going to hear from the CEO of Revolut, a startup about its new game-changing product, they say, that gives you access to some of your salary even before your payday. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Chinese ride-hailing giant Didi is helping its workers establish their first union. This is a landmark move for the country's tech industry, where organized labor is rare. Food delivery leader Meituan is said to be considering a similar move. This as Beijing lays down new rules to crack down on worker exploitation across the sector. Revolut, the UK's most valuable startup, is valued at $33 billion now after raising $800 million in its latest round of funding. It plans a new payday product launch with customers able to draw some of their salary before they reach the normal actual payday. Bloomberg's Francine Lacroix spoke to CEO and co-founder of Revolut about whether this is the way of the future. We're trying to innovate as much as possible then uh, cut out uh, legacy providers by providing uh, better products, cheaper products and more, more innovative products. So Nick, how much more can you, can you do? If I'm a Revolut user, how different, what kind of services will I be able to have in three, four years? Will I be able to ask two months salary in advance? Do I you know, pay for something over 12 month period? Like where are the things that you want to innovate and that I want as a consumer without knowing it yet? Well, initially, we obviously are starting a payday product. Uh, it allows you to withdraw a part of your accrued salary, up to 50% of your salary accrued. Uh, so advantages of it is obviously, instead of using credit card, and instead of using a loan or overdraft, you already get access to your salary that you already earned. And that's just the beginning. Uh, in the future, we can uh, uh, most likely give you access not to only 50%, but uh, even more of your salary, maybe up to up to 100%. When do you want to go public, Nick? Uh, well, s sometime in the future, because we're obviously a venture-funded uh, company. So at a certain point of time, it will happen. But uh, when, uh, I, I don't really know. Hey, are, are you looking for more partners? So how big do you want to be before you actually IPO? You know, you were talking about some of the great new products, innovative products. I was also intrigued by Savings Vault, which is the idea that you get interest rates on a daily basis on what you put into your account. I mean, do you have a target of how big you want to be before deciding or before IPOing? Well, not really, but I think it, we, we need to be uh, at least a bit more mature compared to uh, where we are now. And then um, larger in terms of uh, revenues. I think you know, to, to be able to IPO successfully, we need to be at least in a few billion dollars range uh, of revenue a year. 
That was the CEO of Revolut speaking with our own Francine Lacroix. Amazon says it plans to add more than 40,000 people to its corporate ranks in the U.S. This is the biggest hiring spree ever for the world's largest online retailer, which is planning to hold a career fair on September 15th. As of the end of June, Amazon had 950,000 employees on its books in the U.S., most of them in the company's massive logistics division. NASA is working with Joby Aviation to test the noise footprint of its electric air taxis. The two-week campaign is being held at Joby's flight base near Big Sur, California. This is aimed at helping understand what communities can expect to hear at every stage of flight. Joby hopes to build and operate a commercial fleet of air taxis by 2024. The company went public via SPAC last month. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you join us tomorrow. We're going to be joined by the CEO of ServiceNow, Bill McDermott. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg.